Okay, so what do you think about this example? Maybe I should write it so you, we have it. Somewhere. So let's see. So let's go back. The timer with the set system. Okay, so these are the objects that define it up here C, F, D, G. The condition. Um, in proposition two point three can be checked. So, so to show that for every point in C bar union D, we have an anterior solution. We apply. Proposition to ten. Okay, so how do we apply proposition to ten? So as we see in proposition to ten, if the initial condition is in D, then we have a um, a solution. So if the initial condition is in D. We have an anterior solution. So you can even skip this because there is nothing to check, right? So we check whether BC, the viability condition, is satisfied. So what is the viability condition telling us? The viability condition says that to the flow system, or the flow with a constraint, we need to have a solution. So what is the system? C dot equal to F of C equal to one, where Z belongs to C, which in our case is zero to X star. So what do you think? So when C is in D, we already say we can jump. So we check BC when C is in C minus D, which is what? Zero to X star. So this boils down to check whether Z dot equal to one, Z in zero X star, has solutions for some time, some amount of time, epsilon, when they start from C in zero X star. And the answer to me is yes. Uh, 
And the best way to answer that is to say, well, pick phi of t to be t plus the initial condition and define this for all t in 0 to epsilon with epsilon equal to x star minus c. This is easier to write than to say than to write because basically what we're saying is this is my zero, this is my x star. I'm only checking initial conditions c in this open set. So this is where um, c belongs to in this set. And if I pick a c here, if this is my c, you can see that you have x star minus c amount of flow time, right? Because your solutions flow all the way to x star. No matter where you pick your c, the distance to the jump point is x star minus c. So then solutions can be defined for this length. So epsilon equal to x star minus c is the largest epsilon for which flow within c is possible from C. And it's almost trivial to check that it's a solution, right? I can probably, instead of writing phi there, I should write Z, right? Because that was what the the condition was saying. Okay. So back to this picture up here. If I start in D, I can jump. I have a non-trivial solution. If I start not in D, but in C, I can flow for a little bit. That checks the non-triviality. So now we can do show to show that every maximal solution is complete. We need to rule out condition C or condition B and condition C in proposition to 10. Because remember that every maximal solution has these three possibilities. And if we want to show that every maximal is complete, then basically we need to rule out this B and this C. And we already argued that C does not hold, right? So we know that for this system, G evaluated on D, which is no more than G evaluated on X star, because the jump point is just X star, is equal to zero. And zero belongs to C bar union D because C bar union D is zero X star. Remember C is zero to X star, D is X star, C bar is already C and the union doesn't add anything. Then C does not hold.
The same can be said for B. The argument that shows BC holds on C minus B already shows that B cannot have domain of B bounded if or due to flow due to not being able to flow. Then by proposition two point ten every maximal is complete. Questions? So I definitely invite you to apply this proposition to this example again and think about it. What I'm going to do in less than five minutes is to outline how this will go for the bouncing ball. So for the bouncing ball, with the following data, C equal to every X in R2, such that X1 is larger or equal than zero, F should be lowercase, but that's okay. Um, X2 minus the gravity. D to be any X in R2 such that X1 is equal to zero. X2 is less or equal than zero. And the restitution adjuncts. What you can easily do is to draw this objects x1 x2 this boundary corresponds to the flow set and then this semi axis close corresponds to the jump set and flow when x2 is equal to 0 points down so this is my my f and when you're here it will be x2 is negative so it's in that direction so it points down like that and when you're here it points down like that so it's an f f and every time that you jump from this point you get basically a new value that is having a smaller x2 component. So as we did before from D jumps are possible and G maps to C, right? So we have G on D belongs, okay, is contained in C.
We also have that on D, flows are not possible. The reason is that no matter where you are in D, the vector field will push you away from C. So as you see, D is a subset of C, right? Because C is the entire right half plane closed, and D is just this semi-axis. So no matter where you are in D, you can jump, but you cannot flow because the vector field, if you were to start here, it will push away from C. The only subtle point that one needs to think a little bit about is the origin. At the origin, the vector field is 0 minus gamma. So the vector field points down, right? So that's F at 0. So supposedly one could think one from the origin I could flow, but since the direction is pointing down, if you think about it, as soon as you flow a little bit, x2 becomes negative. And as soon as x2 becomes negative, the first component of the vector field is negative. So as soon as you move a little bit, the vector field will push you away from C. So in other words, the only way to stay in C from the origin would be to do this. But C is vertical, therefore you can't flow either. And you cannot stay at the origin because you have the gravity, unless the gravity is zero. So it turns out that you can easily check that because GD is subset of C, that the C condition of proposition 2.10 does not hold, that flows are always allowed away from D. When you're here, you can flow. So actually the path will be something like this. So therefore B does not hold, and therefore every maximal solution to the system is complete. Moreover, you can prove that because from the overlap of C and D, you only have jumps, then solutions are unique. Every solution to the one symbol is unique. At the end of the day, these conditions again are what we expect and what we wrote down here is that if I want to have existence from points in C bar union D, I need to be able to, with, to stay within C bar union D and move. I shouldn't get a stack. Whether now the solutions that are maximal and complete are Zeno or are continuous or are eventually continuous, that can be established with further properties. We haven't gone there yet. Okay, and I don't think we're gonna have time, but you can think about the following. How can you guarantee that you don't have Zeno, for instance? What is Zeno? Well, I flow, I jump, I flow, I jump, I flow, and jump. And what is happening? The time between every event gets smaller and smaller. So how would you think you can rule out Zeno by looking at this picture? What would you enforce in C, F, D, and G? Let me put it in a different form of this question. The time between consecutive jumps 
gets smaller and smaller. Who determines where you go after a jump? G, right? Who determines when the next jump occurs? D. So basically, through, through F, right? Basically, where G takes you should be far away from D. So what would you enforce? Right, so you can now say that the set D and the set G evaluated at D, it's just another set, this dash thing, are having a minimum separation. In other words, if D does not intersect or if GD does not intersect a neighborhood of D, you should be okay, right? Well, I, I might not have solutions, right? But I definitely will not have very fast switching. As long as my vector field is bounded. So what am I saying? And we'll come back to this as an introduction to this fact and this. So what I'm saying is that very simple problem on the landings. This is my D. This is my GD. So forget about the flows, but if I want to rule out See so, you now, I know that from here, I can only be up here, and I have a finite separation. Let's say this is delta, and I judge it on the same. Am I done? Am I guaranteed that I have not seen? Well, what happens is that I also need to guarantee that when I'm here, the amount of time that takes me So if your velocity vector gets larger and larger and assumes a very large value, probably bounded, then you can go from here to here in finite time. So in other words, you need to have that D, let's say, with a neighborhood. So one condition, maybe very restricted, intersected with G. And for some delta larger than zero, and then f is bound. So the speed of motion is bound. That's one very rough condition. You can refine it. But again, think about this as your deciding parameters or your control nodes. You define your closed loop system as a hybrid system. Some of those things are switching surfaces, let's say. You like to set those switching surfaces such that that is true. So you don't have very rapid switching. And if you remember one of the circuits I show you in lecture one is actually switching according to switching surfaces. So what we actually end up doing was write the whole system as a hybrid system. I will not want these switches to switch very fast. I will impose a condition like that. And under that condition, I would like to prove something about the trajectories. But I definitely want that, otherwise the system will break. Okay? All right. So there's a lot of insight that you can do, get from these very general uh, descriptions. Questions?
So feel free to play with these concepts and read a proposition that has a slight more formality than what I wrote. And get familiar, I try to write the things as much as possible. Get familiar with sets and compositions and neighborhood and vector fields for very simple problems. And then when it comes time to probably deal with more complex